Greetings, and welcome to Etzheim's weekly podcast, recorded live in Richardson, Texas. We invite you now to join us for one of our synagogue's Shabbat messages. Um, but today, what I am going to do is I am going to, um, I'm going to walk through the parasha together. And I feel it's important. I feel that reading the Word of God is a powerful thing. It, it transcends our words. You know, Yeshua is the Word of God. There's something about that. It is, uh, it is God projected to all things. He is the Word of God. Uh, we know that he, his relationship with the Father is very unique. There's a lot of mystery around it. Those who overly try to define it get into trouble. Those who don't give it any definition get into trouble. But somewhere in between, you know, God is and he reaches out to all through his word. Matter of fact, I will tell you, this is kind of an interesting story. I uh, was in the Middle East one time. I've had some pretty wild experiences. I was with a gentleman who invited us to come to meet with billionaires in Saudi Arabia, to meet with the heads of um, some uh, militant groups that were actually uh, against Israel, and yet we were to come as, as believing businessmen. And in the uh, midst of that, I was having a conversation with the gentleman who had invited us. And basically what he had said was this. He had said, the reason I'm hosting this meeting is because I believe that the political and the religious leaders have failed us. We will end up killing each other if we don't learn that we have some common ground. And so he had us in the same room. And I know this is probably polarizing just in the conversation, but it was, it happened. And so, um, you know, in this meeting, I sat with this Muslim gentleman and, um, you know, and he basically said to me, he said, you know, uh, we, we may agree or disagree on things, but you would say, you know, God is the father God is the Son, God is the Spirit. He would say, you know, no Muslim will affirm this. But what I would say to you is that, you know, God is a great God. He rules over all things through his word, who is Isa, is what he said, which is Jesus, Yeshua, his language. And the Spirit uh, enforces all of that. And I thought, you know, that, 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 that's, that's not as bad as what I thought it would be coming out of his mouth. You know, he had an understanding that, that Yeshua is the word. And, um, and so the reason I feel like the word needs to be expressed regularly is because it changes the atmosphere. I mean, I don't know if you've ever been in a bad place where something foul came out of your mouth and then afterwards the Holy Spirit convicted you. Your spirit was wrong. I mean, it might have been really foul. It might have just been that you had a, you know, a bad attitude and the environment twisted. You felt it. It went from an empowering, life-giving moment to something that had a curse in it. Can you relate to that? Words are powerful. And so today, as, um, as we walk through this portion, um, you know, I, I, I have no slides to help you with. I had a lot of cool visuals, but, uh, you know, I, I, it is the, um, the 47th Parasha, it is, um, it is re, depending on how you pronounce that, but it is to see or to behold. And, um, and I love that worship song, behold, Yeshua comes, you know, powerful word. But what I was uh, commenting to David as I was kind of saying, hey, this is what I believe I'm going to talk about today. And he was like, okay, that's good to go ahead and do that. And I tend to try to check in to make sure you know, what I'm thinking is in harmony with what, you know, the, the synagogue is wanting to broadcast it. But, you know, in this week's Torah portion, um, I find a reasonable summary of what I call the rising Messianic Jewish, and I like to call it Yeshuish, movement. Because while Jewish, we do not follow the sages in all things. It is Yeshuish. We follow Yeshua in all things. And there are part places where Yeshua and the sages have strong disagreement. 
like he's in charge. <laughs> you know, that's a, that's, a, that's a disagreement. But it doesn't mean that we reject all things Jewish. Matter of fact, we embrace all things that we can. You know, and the same is true among what I would call kind of a messianic Gentile slash Israel alignment movement that is happening out there. How many of you know there's a massive grassroots movement? Oh, hey, thank you, God. There's a massive grassroots movement to look at the Torah and the gospel under Yeshua or Jesus, depending on the words that they're using, because there's a whole variety of movement there. Are you all familiar that that is happening? That is global. That is grassroots. There's really no one leader. Matter of fact, I like to joke and call it the messy antics movement because it's got all kinds of unique little things that, you know, are trademarks to each little group, whatever it might be. But the one thing that is happening is that I would say is that Yeshua is coming. His word is capturing those that hear and are tuned to his sound. Just like a radio station in the old days, you would turn it, you know, even today, you press the little button, it changes each numbers and so forth. But, you know, you can be, you know, driving, you're set on a station, and suddenly it starts going out of reception, and you have to adjust or find a new station. There are those that are tuning to Mashiach. They're tuning to the Word, which means they're tuning to the Torah, and they are tuning to the Gospel, and there is a hierarchy of truth in all things. I don't know if you know you you realize that, but Yeshua made it clear that there were weighty matters and lesser matters. Now, all truth is equally true, but not all truth is equally important. Would you agree? You know, you know, with our kids, you know, they're getting ready to leave and you look and then you got six things you want to say, but you pick out the one that is going to actually be the most important because you don't want to be a nag, right? You know, something like that. You know, I think that, that Yeshua often comes that way. And it's like, you know, if we measured our against our, our, ourselves against the uh, 613 commandments, whichever ones apply to you and the, you know, uh, some say 47 directives of Yeshua and the Gospels and so forth, you know, we could, it, it's like a bright light shining through a window and you see every spot in the window, right? You know, and you look and you go, oh my gosh, I am never going to get every one of those spots out. But Yeshua, through the blood of the Lamb, through the atonement, through the grace that's been given to us, he looks at us just like we look at our children and we go, man, I, that boy can be a pain, but I love that boy, you know? Isn't that right? Isn't that what we do? So anyways, as we step into this portion, you know, in Deuteronomy chapter 11, um, and I kind of summarized it, and I, is there, a there's no clock anywhere, I guess I'm going to have to put something out, so, uh, <clears throat> you know, starting with Deuteronomy 11, and I, you know, if you've ever watched movie series or television series, you know, every time they start a new episode, what do they do? They always recap where you were, right? So that you know where, what's going on. You know, when you start with this, this Torah portion and you start in Deuteronomy 11, if you start at the beginning of 11, it's quite in interesting because there's a little bit of a recap there. You know, God is saying through Moshe, which is powerful. I mean, just like today when um, we uh, take and we point at the Torah, which was spoken by the mouth of God through the hand of of Moshe, you know, God is making it clear here that he has done things that are etched in, in history and these people have seen it. Everything from coming out of Israel to, you know, a little rebellion in the camp where the earth opened and fire and flames and people went directly to hell without, you know, normal death. I mean, that'd be pretty crazy, wouldn't it? Could you imagine if somebody was you know, stood up and said, hey, by the way, the United States is no longer uh, a believing in God nation. And the earth opened up and flames came and bam, it was closed. Could you imagine? People would be like, you know, don't say that one again. You know, don't, don't, don't do that. That's what happened here. And so what he's making this point is, is like, you guys have seen a tremendous amount 
of me wiping out a nation, the strongest nation in the earth. You've seen me deliver you, bring you out. And, um, and he goes through this, this preamble and he's basically saying, be careful to do all the commandments that I've given you today. And then you get to verse 26 and we start the portion, which is uh, this word, rei, which is to see or to behold. Because I'm setting before you today a blessing and a curse. The blessing if you listen to the commandments of the Lord your God while I am commanding you today. And the curse if you do not listen to the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside from the very, from the way which I am commanding you today by following other gods which you have not known. And it shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which you are entering to possess it, that you shall place the blessing on Mount Gerizim and the curse on Mount uh, Ebal. And they are, uh, are they not across the Jordan, west of the way, towards the sunset in the land of the Canaanites? who live in the Arabah opposite Gilgal besides the Oaks of Moreh. For you are about to cross the Jordan to go in and possess the land which the Lord your God is giving you and you shall possess it and live in it and you shall be careful to do all the statutes and the judgments which I am command, uh, setting before you today. And, um, you know, one of the things that the Lord is saying there, I believe, and I think it's something we try to escape and a misunderstanding of the grace of God can do that, um, but it is that the blessings and the curses are realities in our world, and this is specifically speaking to Israel as they cross into into uh, the nation of Israel as they cross into the land of Israel. And you know, if you've ever seen the the, the pictures of Gerizim and Ebal, there's a measure of curse and blessing in the whole geography of the thing. But but this is the other thing that I believe we need to deal with personally which is this, these commandments which the Lord has given to Israel for all generations are important because they define what activity leads to blessing and what activity leads to curse. And when I talk about the Messianic Yeshuish movement that is growing in the planet, even if undefined and unorganized and so forth, people are awakening to this. And I can remember talking to... to um, John McKee back in the day when I first kind of had my awakening, and this is many, many years ago, and you know, he was telling me about people that were taking Sharpies and writing the law of God, you know, out on their mailboxes and things like that. And you know, these were sincere people looking at commandments and going, how do I enter into them? You know, and um, aligning themselves with what I will term the Israel of God which is not as defined as, well, it's defined by him very clearly. He knows, and there's another phrase we can use called the, the commonwealth of Israel. You were a, who are afar off have been brought near. And so we're in this kind of uh, getting in the same room, but not in the same room because we don't want to be in the same room with those people, but somehow we're kind of in the same room with them. They're weird or we're weird or, you know, they're not weird enough. And, 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 and you understand, this is a very messy movement, but it's beautiful in the heart of God when it's being motivated by sincerity, you know? And, and that's what I thought of when John was telling me about these people that were, he was like, you know, I'm just trying to help them, you know, read these things and understand these in the light of uh, Jewish thought for thousands of years and, you know, bring some cohesiveness so that... People aren't sticking their finger in the eye of somebody who disagrees with them, but instead are, with love, trying to get on the same page. And so I, I am blessed to have uh, Mark Huey back amongst us. He's been with his mom out many, many weeks for many months, actually, but she's, she's gone on to be with the Lord. And, and so Mark and Margaret are, are here today, and I'm so grateful. Mark was very um, instrumental when I first had what I would call my... my uh, awakening moment where Yeshua, uh, by the word of God, came to me and it was um, really clear that I was to return to some ancient paths that relatives and distant past had walked away from. And it was important because God was keeping his promise, like he said in Isaiah 44, 4, that even though it looks like your descendants have disappeared, they will spring up like poplars by streams. They will be regathered. 
and um, it's powerful. And included in that is whosoever will. It was a mixed multitude out of Egypt, and here we are. And so, um, but the point of that, that part of the scripture is the blessings and the curses are real, and you cannot escape them. You can repent and have the blood of Yeshua and the, the curse that Yeshua took on the cross or the stake, remove them, but they are here in this world. His word stands. You know, I think even Yeshua said at one point, you know, it, it's not me who will condemn you, but my words. And it was like, well, what do you mean by that? I mean, like if you're, it's because I have spoken it, it is there, it abides, it stands. And so one of the things that we want to embrace is that God has a pathway for his family. You know, if you ever notice some families, when they go out, their children are dressed a certain way. You know, the wife, the husband, there's a certain culture that's in a house. Um, I believe God has a culture. It is in the Torah, but has the heart of the gospel expressing itself through it, if that makes sense, you know? And so uh, we move into the next portion, which was, the, uh, was 12, you know, and, um, you know, this is the, these are the statutes, the judgments, which you uh, should carefully observe in the land, which the Lord your God of your fathers has given to you to possess as long as you live free on the earth. As long as you live on the earth, wow, that's a pretty big statement, as long as you live on the earth. That means now, right? So you shall utterly destroy all the places where the nations whom you shall dispossess serve their gods on the high mountains, on the high hills, under every green tree, shall tear down their altars and smash their sacred pillars, burn their asherim with fire. You shall cut down the engraved images of their gods. You shall obliterate their name from that place. You shall not act like this towards the Lord your God, like don't take what they're doing and do it unto me. But you shall seek the Lord at the place where the Lord your God has chosen from all the tribes to establish his name there uh, to his, to, for his dwelling. And there you shall come. And there you shall bring your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the contributions of your hand, your votive offerings, the free will offerings, and the firstborn of the herd and of your flock. Uh, there also your house holds shall eat before the Lord your God and rejoice in all your undertakings in which the Lord your God has blessed you. You shall, do, you shall not do all what we are doing today, every man doing what is right in his own eyes. And I just stopped that and I would say, you know, that is a lot of what's going on out here. And, and it may be in sincerity and it may be a misunderstanding of the writings of, of, uh, of uh, Paul, the apostle, um, and uh, the, the reason is, is everybody's just living by their own conscience as if their conscience is the same thing as the word of God. But you're supposed to be living by your conscience as you're studying the word of God. And so I'm not supposed to necessarily be scrutinizing your activity or you mine, but we are supposed to be encouraging one another while it's today to seek the Lord while he's calling to read his word and to align ourselves with that, now that doesn't mean you have to do it the way that family does it or this family, but you should be reading the word and living in your own conscience before that versus what he's saying here, which is every man just doing what's right in his own eyes and justifying it with a scripture here or a scripture there. And, and the reason I say that is, is the more we do that, the more we find unity with each other in the midst of this household of Hashem, you know? And so, um, when you cross the Jordan and live in the land which the Lord your God has given you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies around you so that you live in security, that it shall come about, that the place in which the Lord your God shall choose for his name to dwell, there you shall bring all that I command you, burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, contributions uh, of your hand, your choice votive offerings, and you will vow to the Lord. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God and your sons and your daughters, your male and female servants and the Levites who are within your gates, uh, since he has no portion in the land. Uh, be careful that you do not offer burnt offerings in every cultic place you see, 
but in the place which the Lord chose in your tribes, there you shall offer burnt offerings and there you shall do all that I command you. And I will mention as well, even the craziness of those that have founded, found you know, the Torah. I can remember talking with Mark. There were whole groups that were literally sacrificing animals on altars in Ohio, you know? Because they were looking at some of these things saying, we wanna do what the Lord wants us to do. And that's why I'm saying, when I say messy antics, this thing has been really crazy, but God looks at the heart. But, you know, as they start to understand what is happening is this, all that the father is doing is creating this pressure when he says, no, not here, only there. And it's like, well, there's nothing there. And it's like, that's right. Pay, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, right? Well, there is no uh, temple and so forth. And it's like, well, I don't know. That's a whole debated issue. But, you know, Ezekiel's temple's never been seen. There seem to be some burnt offerings there, you know, whether it was a, you know, th these are all debated, hotly debated items within this messianic expression. But I will tell you this, when you stay within the boundaries, it creates a pressure. Come quickly. Yeshua established Jerusalem as a praise in the earth that honors you and honors your Mashiach. And Lord, please grace us with unity and faith and discernment and patience. And may we be, you know, Yeshua said the one thing that will, that will earmark you as my disciple is that you would have love one for another. Love doesn't mean I agree with you. Love means that even if I don't agree with you in this item, I still have a love for you. You know, you know, even loving those who hate Yeshua, you still love them because you see what he sees in them, which is often that potential that a father sees or a mother sees when they've got a, you know, a tough child. They don't cast them off like everybody else. They keep praying and so forth. And so, but as we get into this, this, um, this next chapter of 12, you know, we start finding out, he starts walking through all of these details. I mean, and it is, it is very detailed. I mean, it is everything from foods that you should eat. And I like to put up there, I said, whole, there's a holy God. There's only one God and he's the holy one. Everything else is not. There's holy places like Yerushalayim is a holy place at this point, and holy altars, holy blood, holy food, holy people, holy worship. You know, so much of what we do is we try to take something that is hot in the world and make it unto God. That's exactly what he said, don't do. Instead, you know, I just want to call out for the creativity that is in the body of Messiah. Where is that new sound? Where is that new technology? Where is that new understanding that, that just exemplifies the presence and the power of Hashem, of, of, of Yeshua, of Elohim, our God? And so, you know, 12 is just, and this is why I said, this like just reminds me, this Torah portion today was just like, this is the rising Messianic movement. They're discovering this, their eyes are being opened. You know, the Torah portion is to see or to behold. We're beholding, maybe in a glass darkly, but we're seeing. And it's kind of like, you know, um, especially as we enter into the world as we are right now, there is significant division in the planet. Division in our nation. You know, to the point of potential civil wars. It's, it's that deep. I mean, I have a friend who now you know, doesn't get to work unless he takes a, uh, a, a shot at his employment. And there's a young boy, he's one of my son, father, uh, son's best friends, and he calls me and he's asking me, what should I do? I have a deep conviction about this, and they are saying, if you can't, then you are voluntary, voluntarily resigning. That's today. That's not something in the future. And this is going on. And how then shall we, the household of our father, live? And there's reminders.
you know, I, I, I'm going to give a, I'm going to jump to my, my point because I feel it so much in my spirit, but it's like the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the people and all who dwell in it. We are not just guests in this earth. We are the inheritors of the earth. And so we have a vested interest in everything that is happening at this point. But we are to engage in it as ambassadors of a kingdom that is transcendent to who is in the presidential office or who is in, you know, the judicial branch of the United States. It doesn't mean we're uninvolved or uninterested. It just means our source, our peace, our authority and ability to prophetically declare and speak is beyond what they understand. It is beyond weapons and votes. It is about beyond political, um, oh, what's that called where they go in and they pay everybody to get their way? Uh, lobbying. Yes, it's also corruption. <laughs> but uh, it is beyond that if we engage. And so you move into Deuteronomy 13. 13 is a big one. There's a lot of the house of Yehuda that says Yeshua violates Deuteronomy 13. I've, I've heard that from a handful of key friends and some rabbis that would say, no, Yeshua was teaching to go away from Torah and therefore he is that false dreamer and prophet and so forth. And I don't care what miracles he did, you know, God warned us not to follow such a one. And that is a true warning. And that is one of the reasons why the pressure to not nullify Torah through the writings of uh, Paul or Christian theology that goes too far to nullify Torah is a problem. They step into the dangers of violating the scripture. You know, it just says, if a prophet or a dreamer uh, of dreams comes among you and gives you a sign and a wonder and the sign and the wonder comes uh, true concerning that which he spoke to you saying let us go after other gods whom you have not known and let us serve them you shall not listen to the to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams for Hashem your God is, is testing you to find out if you love Hashem, your God, with all of your heart and with all of your soul. And you shall follow the Lord your God and fear him. And you shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice, serve him, and cling to him. And you can see where they make their argument, can't you? When somebody stands up, you know, based on a Brit Hadashah, a, a gospel writing or a apostolic writing and says, the law is a curse and is removed. Now, I, the reason I'm saying this is for those that are, you know, historically in the movement, you know, or come from the Jewish side of things, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of adding to the commandments. And for those that have come and are returning to faith and binding themselves, as it says, to the God of Israel and to finding themselves in the same room with those who love the Torah but don't necessarily love the gospel and those that love the gospel and have traditionally not loved the Torah either but yet we're kind of in the same foxhole to some degree do you understand what I'm saying you're you're kind of you know it's kind of like everybody's coming and you're backing up and suddenly you bump in you're like hey what are you doing here uh, uh, we, we like don't even like each. we used to try to kill each other what's going on and it's like well you know what anything that has the word of God etched into it, body, soul, and spirit, the anti-Mashiach, the, the spirit of the anti-Christ, anti-Mashiach, hates that. He's so jealous of Hashem and of Yeshua, the firstborn, you know? I mean, he's so jealous. And so he hates 
And so what you can say is, well, from outside in or inside out, that spirit is coming for us. And you know what? There is strength. There is strength in the Torah. There is strength knowing God has commanded, thou shalt not. Because when you're over in theology that says, hey, everything's removed. I've received the Holy Spirit. I'm forgiven. Now what do I do? Well, just, you know what it ends up often being is every man does what's right in his own eyes and says, well, you know, you know, God told me I was to divorce my wife and marry my secretary. Somehow that's good for him. And it's like, you are delusional. You have forsaken God and put an idol in your heart and removed that was meant to protect and keep you. You understand? And so, you know, God asks us to have our dreams tested, to test our prophets, to test the hearts of those that go with us in the journey, to test your own heart, discern. You can discern whether somebody's doing it for their own glory. You know, they're doing it because they like just to be in front of the room. They're doing it or they're doing it because they love him. And we're all multi-talented, multi-gifted. Nobody here is exactly the same. You know, you know, I can't be Rusty. Rusty can't be Mark. Mark can't be Dan Boron. And I, I can't be any of them. You know, and, and we all are different. But when we come together, we are his family. We are his people. But this is what's interesting too. And I, I mentioned this and I, I say this in the light of some of the things Rusty was uh, speaking just a few weeks ago. Lord put on his heart. Is this... This scripture, this scripture goes on and it talks about, you know, I mean, this is really, really tough stuff, but you shall follow the Lord, your God and fear him. You shall keep his commandments, listen to his voice and cling to him. But, but that prophet or dreamer that dreams shall be put to death because he counseled rebellion against the Lord, your God, who brought you out of, uh, from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery to seduce you from the way in which the Lord your God commanded you to walk so you should purge the evil from among you. And um, that, little port, that little scripture, when we jump later into 1 Corinthians, you'll see it's, it's a quote, it's a parallel. And, and it goes on and it talks about your brother, your mother's son, of your, or your own son or your daughter, or the wife that you cherish, or a friend who is on, who is, is it your own soul? And I, you know, I was even thinking about the way David and, and, and Jonathan, as we were, you know, talking earlier today, they were in each other's hearts, you know. Um, Let us go and serve other gods whom neither you nor your fathers have known of the gods of the peoples who are around you or near you or far off from you. From one end of the earth to the other, you shall not yield to him or listen to him. And your eyes shall not pay him, nor shall you spare or conceal him, but you shall surely kill him. Your hand shall be the first against him to put him to death, and afterwards the hand of all other people. Okay, this is not the Yeshua most people are talking about. These commands are difficult commands. Would you agree? I mean, I love my brother. I love my friends. I've got friends that don't believe in Yeshua. I love them. You know, now we're not in the land of Israel. But maybe that's part of what's going on right now. Is that there's an awakening of people who are going, I am the Israel of God. Now I may not be Jewish, but I have descendants or, or, or heritage from this. But yet I'm with him. How does this work? And there was displacement theology that at one time the Christian community said we are the Israel of God Jewishness is cursed and the kingdom is ours raised up armies conquered kingdoms you know subdued Germanic witchcraft in the north I mean you know Charlemagne if, if you look into history this stuff has happened and if we do not know history, which is interesting, in some of the schools, history is being removed. Instead, there's teaching social justice. We're, 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 we're heading to something. 
you know, great reset is a lot of language that's out there. Some, you know, the reset, hey, I believe in a, you know, I believe in a jubilee. That's a bit of God's great reset, isn't it? You know, so, you know, some would say we need to reimagine government now. We need to change the way we're doing everything. You know, and I, I kind of love the way the American institution was set up. I'm a, I'm a constitutional oriented person. I love that. I think it is based on the word of God. I can see the parallels. But you know, when I meet somebody and they say that to me, I say, you know what? Maybe you're right. Have you seen what God really likes to have happen? Maybe we should reimagine government. Maybe we should really establish the kingdom according to his commands. And, you know, maybe we should do that. You got a good idea. Let's explore that. This is what he says. What are you thinking about? I encourage you to do that. By so doing, people would be saying, maybe that's not what we want to do, right? But you would be saying, you know what? I think he plans to do that anyways. It says that his Torah will go out of Zion and he will rule the nations as with a rod of iron. That's what it says. That's where it's going. So as everything is unfolding in our day and in, in our age, these are exciting and terrifying days, aren't they? Exciting and terrifying days. And I was just looking at it all in our Torah portion going, man, it's all in there. This stuff is scary. I mean, could you imagine if I sat with my... You know, my, my, well, I'm actually, my brother-in-law is a believer. But uh, if I sat with some of my friends and I'm like, hey guys, I was thinking maybe reimagining government. Let me just read this to you. Blah, 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 you know, and so forth. And here's a city. If a city should counsel together to go against God and to say, this is no longer a city based on God's biblical principles. That what are you supposed to do? Oh, we're supposed to do a big inquiry. How does it end? Oh my gosh, have you seen how this ends? Have you guys read this tour portion? You wipe out the city, you take everything that's in it and you burn it and you, you never rebuild the city. It's like a mountain heap forever to look at and say, don't do what they did. Now, I, I, listen, I'm drawing this to you because I want you to understand what you've gotten involved in here. Some of you, you know, you know, you look at this stuff and you say, is this actually what he's going to do when he comes back? You know, I mean, there's some red letters and I love the red letters. You know, that's, you know, Yeshua's words alone in the gospel. But there's some red letters that just people tend to ignore, you know, where he says, take and bring those who would not submit to me and then slay them in front of me. It's like, that's all red letters. And it's like, whoa, whoa, you know, can we skip over that? And, you know, don't judge lest you be judged. You know, that's, we'll stick with that red letter, you know. But I will tell you, Yeshua is not yours. He's his own. You know, I, I, I love that lion, witch in the wardrobe from C.S. Lewis, where he said, you know, well, is, is he safe? Aslan, this king that rules for the, the emperor, he's like, well, he's not really safe, but he's good. And, and that is the lion of the tribe of Judah who has overcome, who came as a suffering servant, who laid his life down to redeem men from every tribe, every tongue, every nation, which means it's, it's meant to be happening this way. Bunch of diversity. Like, hey, can I do the hula dance to the kingdom? I mean, is that cool? Can I hula dance to God? You know, and it's like, well, we have to, sure, I think, as long as your hula dance isn't, so I, I mean, you know, these are all the questions that you wrestle through. Well, you know, can I sacrifice my babies to the Lord? Nah, that, 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 that's not cool. He says, clearly, don't do that, right? People are trying to figure out how do I serve this God who defines himself? And I believe they are coming to this congregation because we're wrestling with it here. In the leadership, it's wrestled here. I'm sure Rusty has a different thought than Mark, has a different thought than Dan. And, you know, hey, we're always hearing from John McKee. He's got a different thought. You know, and if you ask me, I've always got an opinion, you know. Sometimes two of them on the same thought, you know. But, um, you know, this is... This is the kingdom. This is our household. This is a culture that Father is building. 
And this is just like siblings, right? Like, you know, how many of you got your siblings? You know, your older sister, I have an older sister, you know, and she's like a 4-0 average. I think she, she had one B in her history of, of school and it was because uh, she didn't turn over the test and had two more questions. That was it. Otherwise, straight A's and everything. You know, I love my, I love my sister, Carol. We don't agree on everything, you know, but, uh, but she's, she's awesome. You know, we've got people like that here. How many here, you know, it's like the person who always does everything, like right. There's probably some of those in here. But you know what the, 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 the thing that the Lord says is that, hey, he is our unity. He is our peace, so forth. Uh, Deuteronomy 14, we started moving into clean and unclean animals. You know, I mean, I had somebody kind of wake up when they said, you know, you know, clean and clean, unclean, that's all just Moses stuff. I said, yeah, but wasn't it Noah who had clean and unclean animals? Wasn't, you know, God speaking to Noah saying, bring in this many clean and this many unclean. And, and he was like, did he say that? I'm like, well, it looks like he did. You know, it's amazing what happens when you read the word. And there's a reason why I'm doing this today. I felt I was meant to. All of my talking is not worth what when I read on the page. You understand? There's a lot of opinion, and I can put my personality and my emotions and, 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 and thank the Lord. I have a grace. I have an anointing to speak. I have authority in my voice. He has given that to me. And so regarding things, I have to be careful what I endorse because otherwise we use our human Grace, you know, whatever gift God's given you, you can do the same thing. You can use it for the wrong things too. And so, but these words on the page need to be read. They need to be spoken because I tell you this, they do send encouragement to the believer because as we go on to the next section, so I got to keep moving. I, I, I could spend forever in all of these sections. It's so deep and exciting and terrifying and inspiring you know it, it's wonderful but the story keeps going on and um, but it's important right now in the day that we're living with when somebody asks you a question speak the word declare the Torah well the law of God the Torah of God the teachings of God say this and let them debate with that rather than you summarize it, put it in your own self and say, well, I think this. What is the difference between the weight of those two things? You know, I think it's in Hebrews. It says like uh, if, if we teach, let our teachings be the oracles of God. If we prophesy, let us prophesy in alignment with the oracles of God because what does your chaff have to do with my wheat. You know, God says to the false prophets, I think it's in Jeremiah 16, that they're prophesying their own opinions. But if they had waited and stood in my presence, then they would have spoken my word and they would have delivered people from their sin. And, um, you know, it's, it's like God's word activates the planetary immune system. Did you know that, you know, like the Lord of the Rings, you know, the, the, the plants, the animals, the, you know, the trees of the tr you field, they clap their hands. You know, there's, there's life in this planet that still groans and travails and it waits for the sons of God to, to awaken, to know who he is, to stand in his word. And it says God looks to and fro across, across the face of the whole earth looking for somebody in whom he can show himself strong. But so many of us, we're, 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 it's all our own opinion. It's all our own, and we're kind of enjoying our own ability to spin and to, you know, balance truth and so forth, versus just, thus saith the Lord in Deuteronomy here, boom, bam. You live with it. Or die with it. Because I go back to the beginning. And this is what you need to understand. The blessings and the curse cannot be escaped. Cannot be escaped. There is one way to be delivered from the curse of disobedience. 
one way. He who has the Son has life. He who hath not the Son hath not life. So while we affirm the Torah, the only way to escape the curse that it outlines, not that it's a curse in and of itself. It is a definition of what is right, holy, and good, is how Paul says it. By coming to faith, do we abolish this? God forbid, we do not. By coming to faith in Messiah and understanding, we establish this. Because even if a man stumble or fall, if he repents, he can get back up again. You know, the scripture says, even if your brother repents seven days or seven times in a day and comes to you and says, from his heart, please forgive me. What are we commanded to do? Forgive. What do you think Hashem does when you come to him with a sincere heart? Please forgive me. What is he saying? Of course I forgive you. But it wasn't cheap to forgive you. You know, if my son puts a baseball through the neighbor's house seven times in a day and says, Father, I'm so sorry. I turned. I tried not to. And I have to still pay for the neighbor's window, don't I? Somebody had to pay for that sin. And it is not cheap. And that's why I think in Hebrews, it says, hey, you know, if people put aside the law of Moses, they die on the testimony or two or three. So it is for those who see the blood of Messiah as a worthless, unclean thing. Oh yeah, I'll just continue to do my sin. And I'm sorry, God. Yeah, no, bam. Oh, oh, oh I'm, I'm sorry. Blood of Christ. Do you think that that's gonna work? That is not going to work. And woe to our own hearts. And I say this even to myself. You know, when we live in a world where the culture is different than the kingdom culture, we get worn down. We get soft. We get hard. We get, we get polluted. And that's what he is saying. Take counsel to yourself that you don't be deceived. Do this. And so, anyways, we move into 15. And you start to see that God talks about his own jubilee, his own forgiveness, and so forth. And it necessitates, it seems to be that because he did this, you need to do this. Because you've been forgiven, you need to forgive. Is that not a biblical principle? Because you've been released from debts, you need to be one who is willing to release debtors to yourself. And there is a difference between how you deal with the household of faith and other people. You can have a business where you're loaning and lending and doing and you're following your principles. But when you're dealing with a brother from your household, you need to forgive him. You need to release him. When he's done paying his debt, you need to bless him on his way out. Even, if, I mean, even to the point of slavery. That's the term that's used there. It's not servant. It's not hiring somebody. Somebody gets so bad into debt that they become the slave of somebody else because of their debts. But when they're done with their six years, you send them out. Now, I just throw that out there because I don't think people actually think through sometimes what's going on here when you start to say, you know, I really want to honor the Torah. It's like, oh, have you read some of these chapters? You know, you know, I, I mean, I, you see what I'm saying, right? And so, uh, but there is a culture. And I have a friend who I really love. He's got a, he's got a ministry. He's, I, I like to say he's a Messianic Christian is how I think of him. His name is Craig Hill. He's got a ministry called Family Foundations. And it's, he's brilliant at what he does. But, um, you know, he, he, he deals with big principles. Com, holy and common. He teaches on that. He teaches on ancient paths. The blessings and the curse. Because so many people today... Gentile background, maybe Christian, maybe not Christian, whatever. They got all these curses operating in their life. They come to Messiah. They don't understand how to change the ways that stop the curse. You know, we could call it deliverance in some ways. Deliverance, you know, used to just mean, you know, somebody got a demon cast out of them. Now deliverance is kind of a bigger picture where it's like, well, how do I get the curse off of me? Cursing my money, cursing my time. You know, cursing, you know, the things that are cursed in my life. How do I lift that off? And I will tell you, some people out there, yes, you have those operating in your life. How do you 
get free? The blood of Yeshua is the, the, the price that redeems you from a curse. But some of that, you've got to stop doing the same thing you're doing. You know, it, 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 there's a bad activity and it's not working and you just keep doing it, asking for forgiveness, but you keep doing it and you wonder why things don't change. But that's because there's the ancient paths. There's the culture of the house of God that we give ourselves to. And, uh, and it changes things. And so, you know, uh, 15 is that. And then when we move into Deuteronomy 16, and um, see, I'm talking too much. I should have been reading more, you know, because I can't even say the stuff that's on this page the way he says it. It is powerful. When we point, you know, and we say, this is the, this is the Torah of, that was spoken to, through God and written by the hand of Moshe. This is not anybody's opinion. And that's why God says, when you stand up to judge, don't think it's your opinion. It's not my opinion versus somebody else's opinion. It is his word and all of our opinions need to find harmony with that word. And we may not see it exactly the same. And that's okay. As long as we're always lining ourselves to this word. And so even when you get to 16, it's got the spring and the fall feasts in it. And when I looked at it, I thought, you know, this is us. This is our messy little, you know, movement that I think, um, and I'm going to jump through some of this stuff because I'm out of time or getting low on time. What time is it? I guess I got a little bit of time. But, um, but I think of the, uh, I think of the matovu that we start every synagogue service with, Right? How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel. And, um, but why is it that we, why is it that we, why is it that we use that from a Jewish historical context? You know, Balaam, Balaam was like many believers today. You need to hear this. Because woe to you that go the way of Balaam. Woe to you who go the way of Balaam. A prophet with an anointing. And it was said of him, whoever he blesses is blessed. And whoever he curses is cursed. That's how well respected he was. And I'll tell you this. God does not deny that he was a prophet. Matter of fact, he heard what God said to him, which was do not go. Because he was being hired because they couldn't defeat Israel. They had to come up with a different plan. So they hired him and said, we need spiritual blessing or cursing over this nation. And this was the, um, this was the, uh, not the Amalekites, the Mo Moabites. And so he went, and you remember the story, the donkey won't take him and starts to talk because he's beating the donkey, you know? I mean, and he's like, hey, you know, I'm trying to save your life. This angel's about to kill you. And, and, yeah, I mean, it's one of those stories, normally a kid's story, but it's not a kid's story when you look at what it is. But he goes. Finally, because he's so stubborn, God says, well, go if you're going to go, but I, you only say what I put in your mouth. So he goes. He's hired. He's up on the mountain. He's looking out over Israel, and he's getting ready to try to deliver a curse. But what comes to him is a blessing. Oh my gosh, the king, the Moabite king is furious. I have paid you, I brought here. If you're, you know I mean? If you can't curse them, certainly don't bless them. But the blessing, you know, it starts with him saying he's having his eyes opening, but it's, then it goes into the matovu. 
I mean, can you imagine this? Your enemies have, can't defeat you because God is protecting you. So they hire somebody who knows God to try to curse you. And so he gets up on the mountain. He's ready to curse. And instead, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob. Your dwellings, O Israel. And the Moabite king is listening to this. This is what God is saying. And this is what I would say when we dwell in unity and we make the word the center of our definitions of what is blessed and what is cursed. What is the right action? What is wrong? This is how he looks at us. And when our enemies come to curse us, they are forced to bless us. And even the things that they meant for evil. I mean, remember the story of Joseph. He ends the story with what you meant for evil, God meant for good. And so even the curse cannot alight when we are right with Hashem. And that's, that's a Jewish heritage truth. And then it ends with 24.9. Blessed is he. I mean, this is, you have to understand, this is Balaam who has the reputation. Whatever he blesses is blessed. Whatever he curses is cursed. And what's coming out of his mouth is, whoever blesses you, O Israel, is blessed. And whoever curses you, Israel, is cursed. Man, that was a twist on that guy, wasn't it? And Moabites should have been learning, right? They should have been fearing the Lord, both Balaam and them. But you know what ends up happening? Balaam counsels, well, you can't beat them as long as God is happy with them. So you know what you do? Let's seduce them. I mean, this is so wicked. This was a guy, I mean, this is a guy, I mean, I, Hitler, Balaam, kind of the same betrayal. You know, all the warnings, sending women in to seduce men. I mean, and you, you, you get to pay or you get into all of the stuff that goes forward. And, and, and I will tell you this, and this is the beauty of the other pieces of this parasha. There is a kingdom covering. When you are in right standing with God, you will be protected. You will be protected. Now there is an opportunity to be a martyr, which we read in Revelation, cry out from under the throne of God. And there is a certain number of martyrs that need to have been martyred before he takes up his kingdom and does his deal. Theologically, check that out. I believe that's very accurate. But there is a kingdom covering for those. You know, Psalm 91, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, my refuge, my fortress in God who I place my trust. You know, it goes through. And you know what he says? Because he has known my name. This is the father's response. Because he has known my name, therefore I will deliver him. And I will set him securely. And I will establish him. Those are powerful words. That's what Balaam and the spirit of the world are up against. They're up against my father when he's not happy with them. You understand? You know, it's like kids. It's like, well, my father can take your father, you know? It's like, are you kidding, man? My father does this and everything's gone, you know? Like, you don't mess with my father. You don't want to make him angry. Because when God unsheaths his sword, woe, because he won't put it back until it's drenched with blood. Now, I remember Mike Bickle having a, a message, and I, I'm an old friend of Mike Bickle. And, um, and I love him very much. Don't agree with everything, but I love him very much. But he had this revelation where the Lord came to him and he was just saying, Lord, I love you. I love you so much. And the Lord said to him, will you love me when I'm robed in red? And there's this scripture in Isaiah that talks about when the Lord is trampling his enemies under feet. I mean, you guys have read like the book of Revelation, right? You know, this is, this is not your kindergarten Sunday school gospel. This is 
the Torah and the prophets and the scriptures for what they really say. This is not child stuff. This is better than any video game somebody can dream up. This is terrifying, exciting. There is death to, to shun and life to gain. And this is our promise. You will be, if anyone fiercely assails you, it will not be from me. Whoever assails you will fall because of you. Behold, I myself have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and brings out a weapon for its works. And I have created the, the, the destroyer to ruin. No weapon that is formed against you will prosper. And every tongue that accuses you in judgment, you will condemn. This is the heritage of the saints of the Lord. And their vindication is from me, says the Lord. Do you know, if that was burning inside of us as much, it'd be like, oh, well, we are going to come against that and we're going to take you to court. And it'd be like, man, you do that at your own peril. Balaam had his day of thinking he was successful. A few chapters later, he dies as God wipes out all the Moabites. And not one Israelite died in that event. There is a kingdom covering there is a kingdom covenant God's warning us here don't spend money on foolish things there's a lot of things we spend good money on that in the end they won't deliver incline your ear to me listen and that you may live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you according to the faithful mercies shown to David Behold, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander of, for the peoples. Behold, you will call a nation you do not know, and a nation which does not know you will run to you. Because of the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. And you know, we do live in this dynamic. We do live in this dynamic. But it is Yeshua who is the ultimate fulfillment of this. How many from nations that didn't know anything about the heritage of the Torah or any of this have run to Yeshua? Because God glorified his name above all names. And um, John 4, 1 through 6 was part of the Torah portion. And it was, there is a kingdom confession. Our confidence is in Yeshua, the Messiah that has come in the flesh. And the reason it's so important you understand the flesh is because some typical Christian theology in my own experience, and I would say it's more what they put out than what some of them believe when you get down to what, what's spoken in the scriptures, but many are thinking when we die, we just go live in heaven. That's a traditional belief, but it is not about heaven. Heaven is a holding tank until heaven and earth become one and there is a new heaven and a new earth. You understand? So eternity is not heaven. Eternity is a new heaven and a new earth. After this earth has had a millennial reign with Yeshua reigning out of Zion. Now that is a different theology. And God is saying this. He didn't come to just save our souls. He came to save our bodies, our nations, our geography, and all that goes with it. And our confession is him. And it's important to read that. You know, every spirit that confesses that Yeshua Messiah has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Yeshua is not from God. This is the spirit of the anti-Messiah, which you have heard is coming and now is already in the world. And it, you know, I, this is what I want to make clear. Whoa, be careful where you're looking for your Torah information. If your Torah information is somebody who's saying to you, Yeshua is not the Messiah, you know, scrap that, come join us. That is a voice that, let's go back to chapter, what was it, chapter 13. What do we do with people like that? Oh yeah, you know, that's not our, that's not our folks. That's not our folks. They're following another spirit. And so be careful with that. And so um, there's kingdom culpability. That means if you sin, you will be judged. Even if you say you're in the household of faith. And this whole 
uh, 1 Corinthians, it, it reminded me of what Rusty was going, you know, talking about a few weeks ago in Matthew 18. There is due process with God. He's not a summary judger. You know, he likes due process. He likes dignity. We're not supposed to assume we know it all. We're supposed to explore and investigate before you judge a matter. But this is about those that are saying that they are brothers in Messiah with you, but they are continuing to live a lifestyle that is sexually immoral, that is opposite. They're a swindler. They're an idolater. They're greedy. They, they actually love the world is really, but they want the benefits of the kingdom while they love the world. And you know, what he's saying is do not even eat with these people. There are people you don't eat with. And if you've got nobody in your life that you don't eat with, you're probably not honoring this. There are, or are you there? You have no friends. I don't know. The whole COVID thing has got everybody locked up inside. But this is my point. There is a power in, in shunning somebody and saying, I will not fellowship with you. Because then they know that this lifestyle in eternity will cost them hell, but in the temporary will cost them fellowship with believers. I know, I know that this is not what people teach. But this is what it says. And you know what? If we keep giving people our own thoughts, nobody's going to get free. But if we give them God's thoughts, you're going to wrestle through it. You're going to do it wrong. You're going to be more angry than you should. You're going to be too nice to somebody you should have been, you know, disciplined with. We do it with our kids all the time, our poor kids, right? You know, it's like my parents give it their best shot, you know, at raising us. But this is what it says. It says, do not judge those who are... Um, it says, what business is mine to judge outsiders? So when it comes to the world that doesn't confess that they're in him and know him, you don't shun them. That's what he's saying. But with those that are saying, we're here, we're in it, but all of this is fine, have nothing to do with them. Certain TV evangelists and stuff, you should have nothing to do with. They're not promoting the truth. You know, they may make you feel good. But then he goes on to say, but those who are outside, God judges, Remove the evil person from among yourselves. What do you think that is, that statement in Corinthians? Remember what we're reading back here? When he said, remove the evil from among you. The, uh, Corinthians is not abandoning Torah. It is, it is applying Torah in, in the chapter. And so, um, you know, I, I, I want to mention this as I come to <clears throat> finalizing here. You know, I'm a bit of a talker, so. But, um, you know, we look to Yeshua. How then shall we live? You know, it just said, um, from that time forward, Yeshua began to preach and say, repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You know, the song, you know, behold, Yeshua comes. There is time to flee the wrath of God. You know, it's funny when you sit around right now and I listen to like, you know, my son's very close friend. They room together. They've, they've taken a house that they rent together. And he's wrestling through tremendously whether he will take this shot or not take this shot because his job is on the line. He's checking to see what his alternatives are because there is a confrontation happening. It is here for him. But Yeshua says, repent because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. There is a wrestling on the side of the enemy that is happening. It is not us that are meant to be freaking out. It is them because he is coming. And I will tell you one of the biggest signs is this movement, this kingdom of God, this kingdom, the house of Israel movement that's not rooted in some replacement theology, but uh, we're all under Hashem theology and people find their place and listen there's whole groups of those that 
say they are Israel that need to repent regarding Yeshua, Mashiach. And we don't shrink back from that in this fellowship. David doesn't do that. We're not, we're not trying to get Orthodox Jewish pat on the head here. We're with Mashiach. We're Yeshuish. Yeshuish. And he is the ultimate Jewish. He's the one who gave the commandments. He's the one who spoke to Moshe, in my opinion. But Yeshua was going about in all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the kingdom of God um, and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. And that's the other piece I want to say is this. All of those curses that cannot be escaped. You do the crime, you do the time. That can all be jubileed in the favorable year of the Lord as Yeshua offers extension of repent and be restored to the blessings of the kingdom. And <clears throat> today, uh, by the authority of the word, I want to speak the breaking of sickness among this body. There's been too many sick in our body. And if it's because of unbelief or if it's because of sin, it's because we haven't rightly understood the body of Messiah. These are all reasons biblically you can be sick. I want to break the foothold of every virus, every bacteria, every flu, every um, uh, just accidents and errors. I want to break those because it says that the Lord will have his angels be, have charge over us that we wouldn't even dash our foot against a stone. Now, I want to break that because in the confrontation, that's what Yeshua was doing. When he went town to town and city to city, he wasn't just saying, here, believe my truth and then leaving. He was saying, let me demonstrate the power that is in my kingdom. And by that authority, I release healing to those that are at home and in bed and sick and tired and brain fog or took a shot or didn't take a shot for DNA to be re regenerated and restored and repaired because nothing in this body is outside of his domain. Nothing, nothing. He is, he, he is the one who resuscitates the dead, right? And so we stand with him, but let us be aligned with him, under him. We are not those that need to debate based on our own free. We in this room have a God. We're not like the world that's like, I've got no God. I do what I want. I'm like, oh, I do not do what I want. I do what my father and my God want. And it's like, well, you're just, you know, some weak something or other. I said, no, I'm smart. When he comes, you'll be dead. And I will be standing there with him, worshiping. So, fear him who not only can hurt your body, but for him that can throw your soul into eternal damnation. That's what the scripture says. We do not fear those who go door to door with shots, or we don't fear those that sit in, you know, a caged, you know, Washington, D.C. We don't fear them. We remind ourselves here that we fear one. And we have what's called the fear of the Lord. And in that fear, every other fear is lessened. That does not mean we're disrespectful. That does not mean we look for a fight. But what that means is we obey and woe to the Balaams that come and woe to the armies that come because we are not without a covering. We are not without a covenant. We are not a, a without one who does the confrontation. And, um, and you know, I'm going to end with this. And, and, and so this is my last piece here. <clears throat> you know, I really just get so excited following God. I see so many things that are so amazing. <clears throat> and I'm going to close with this because I spend my day doing this every day. Not just studying the word, but this whole Matovu thing that I was reading to you um, from Numbers 
one of the segments of that blessing. If you want, you can look it up right now. It's Numbers 24. One of those statements said, so how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. <clears throat> I have a friend who got burned when he was a kid and somebody slathered him with aloes so he didn't scar. You know, how many you know that aloes can help, you know, remove, you know, burns? <clears throat> this guy later in life starts looking at this and says, you know, like aloes that are planted by the Lord. And it's not L, lowercase L-O-R-D, it's the sacred name, it's Yodei Vave. And so he started looking into aloe. What is in the aloe plant that makes it so amazing? And I want you to see something. This is from PubMed. This is uh, National Institutes of Health. This is where, like, Dr. Uh, Fauci, that's his organization, however you feel about him, you know. <clears throat> but this is just a, a summary of something that I want you to see that the Word of God is not just spiritual. It's natural. That's why Jesus Christ came in the flesh. God was redeeming flesh and blood and bone and earth and wind. He was taking it all. And so this was just, this is a summary review, extraction, purification, structural characteristics, biological activities, pharmacolo pharmacological applications of ace manin, a polysaccharide out of aloe vera. <clears throat> And I just have the blue highlighted, but you can read the whole section. But it's Ace Manin, considered one of the main bioactive polysaccharides of aloe vera, possesses immunoregulation. You know what immunoregulation means? Overactive immune systems come down, underactive immune systems go up. Immunoregulation. Anti-cancer. Anti-oxidation. Oxidation is like what it comes from living life. Wound healing, bone proliferation promotion, neuroprotection, uh, intestinal health activities, among others. Another one of these reviews. Ace Manin has various medicinal properties like osteogenic, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, which accelerate healing of lesions. Also, uh, also Ace Manin is known to have antiviral and anti-tumor activities in vivo through the activation of immune response. It was concluded aloe vera has immense therapeutic uh, basis. Now, this is what I found remarkable. Whoop. Can you go to the next slide? This is the shape of a mannose molecule that we're talking about, the ace manin. Do you see it there in the upper left in the green with the box around it? Does anybody recognize that? That's its structural shape. Do you see the shin? It's in the same structural shape. You see that? Okay. My friend, who's on some of the patents for this, was up speaking in a seminar and was describing the technology and how it works. There was a Jewish rabbi in the front who's also a scientist. He comes running up to him after the meeting. Is that really what it looks like under a microscope? Is it structured like that? And Dr. Reg McDaniel says, yeah, it is. Are you telling me that my creator put his sheen on every cell in my body? Hallelujah. And he's like, no, I'm not telling you that. He's like, I'm just telling you that's what it looks like. And he's like, well, that is the sheen. And if you go to the next slide, you know, this is powerful. That sheen letter is on every mezuzah on every door because for the heritage Jewish understanding the sheen represents it all it all the Shema the sheen even Jerusalem they say is in the shape of the sheen you know Psalm 19 says that all of creation declares the glory of God. And you can go to the next slide. I'm just making you a little point. This thing, this thing goes right down to biology. 
It doesn't go down just to theology. Don't let them convince you that we talk about a kingdom that is in, you know, uh, emotional manipulations or theological, you know, thought process like, um, like placebo activity. You believe, therefore you get healed. You know, everybody can do that. No, no. Our God is not like their gods. Our God created the molecules. And I will tell you, we as Israel of God are meant to be an immune system to this planet. Antiviral, antibacterial to the biology. We are meant to be speaking into the sociology of our world and saying, it's not us that we preach. It is him that we preach because we fail. Everyone here has sin. And if you say you don't, then you're a liar. That's what the scripture says. It is not us that we preach, but it is him. And it is him that is coming. Behold, thy kingdom come. So that's my message. So. Yes.